forensic science have actually been able to contribute quite a lot to the criminal justice system. But some of the challenges that we have been facing in forensic science has to do with interpretation. So what does that evidence mean within the context of the case? A lot of the methods that are used in forensic science are actually visually based, meaning that they are reliant upon the experience of the observer. There is a level of subjectivity involved, which means that there is always a risk of being exposed to, for example, cognitive biases that may impact upon our decision making and the interpretation of forensic evidence. So it's actually really important that once we are in court, we are able not only to accurately be able to say what this evidence means, but also in a transparent way. It's therefore quite important to try to understand and be a little bit more transparent about how people reach certain decisions. So at UCL, we are now trying to merge and look at can AI help us address some of these challenging questions. For example, to looking at how eye tracking could give us a little bit more of an insight in terms of how people go about a task. And more importantly, how do experts reach their decision outcome? So these are the wearable eye trackers that we are using as part of our research here at UCL. And as you can see, they basically look like a pair of glasses. And what these glasses essentially have that are quite different from normal glasses is that they have inbuilt cameras that could capture the gaze movement of, of your eyes. What will happen now is that when an expert or a participant in any research is wearing the eye tracker and looking at some of these features, the eye tracker will then be able to record how long they're looking at a certain feature, are they going to go back to certain features, and that will help us understand that decision-making path of how they actually went about the task or the methods that they are interacting with. We have preliminary found that actually people uh, don't necessarily go about the task in the same way. And in very cut clear cases, that doesn't actually matter because they essentially reach the same interpretation of the skeleton. But what we are trying to do now is to add a layer of complexity to it. Because if you imagine in crime scene investigations or, uh, or criminal cases, you're not all, always dealing with an intact skeleton. Sometimes it might be partial or fragmented or burnt. And that's also when we want to start to look at the more complex layers of, of decision making. We want to know what an expert is looking at when they make the decisions because we make decisions sometimes very intuitively and we're not able to necessarily justify the way we make the decision. Often we are actually encoding some information uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the method that we're applying in the moment. Uh, and we might be aware of the information, we know that it's there, we know that we see it, but we don't know how we integrate that into the decision we're making. Even between experts that have very similar experiences, very similar background, the way they look at a skull will potentially be very, very different. They'll be prioritizing very different areas, potentially. We also ask them to verbalize how they make their decision. And that uh, goes along with, we sort of try and match that with what the eye tracker is telling us. And at that point, we can sort of tell what parts they're aware of and what parts they're maybe not as aware of. And if they, for example, say, oh, I specifically looked at these three features, they're the ones that I focused on the most, the eye tracker might actually tell me, well, I actually spent more time in a completely different area. And this is the information that will then help us to feed into a machine learning system. We can actually feed back the research that we're doing with the eye tracking. Now that we kind of understand how experts go about the task, could we then train an AI model to start evaluating some of these methods that we are currently using, but also uh, develop new methods. This is an example of a mock crime scene study looking at how do people actually go about a crime scene? What areas will they focus on? What type of questions will they ask in order to know what to target? What type of evidence are they going to collect? And also in what order they will collect those evidence? And will this actually matter uh, depending on the level of experience that people have in crime scene investigation? Human expertise is extremely important in terms of bringing that creativity and critical thinking. So it's not about the fact that the technology will replace the human and all that you will see in court is a computer essentially giving the answers. 
because the questions that will be posed in court are not always going to be a cut clear, is this this person or is this that individual and so on. It actually is much more complex and in order to capture that complexity you actually need humans. Therefore, at UCL, we are working very closely not to exclude the human and the machine as two separate things, but actually merge them together in order to be able to work in a collaborative way of strengthening the interpretive parts of forensic science and the interpretations that are made at court. So the future of AI in forensic science is actually quite exciting. If we go about this in an ethical and responsible way, there are huge opportunities in terms of merging that technology to either develop new methods, improve the methods that we're currently having, and that could have implications in terms of how people are conducting casework, how they're doing their analysis in the laboratory, and so on. If we get the human and the machine to work together, we can actually be able to produce even better accurate interpretation and address some of the challenges that forensic science is currently facing.